Some of you who have uh, burdened yourself with the study of, of English literature uh, might have, have come across a, a famous book called Moby Dick by, by Herman Melville. Has anyone had the, the pleasure or displeasure of, of working your way through that, that winding, winding tale? Well, the, I want to tell you about an, an image that I can't quite shake uh, from, that, from that book. It, it's a story, roughly, uh, about a, a very prideful man, Ahab, named for the, the evil king, uh, who decides to, uh, out of his pride, uh, to, to catch a great whale that he has no business trying to, to, to catch. It's an act of pride or, or more technically hubris uh, on, his, on his part. And there, there's a, a scene, and it's late in, in the book, uh, where Ahab has captured a sperm whale. And he's tied it up to half of the ship, and they've cut off most of the body, and they just have the, the big head uh, where all the, the precious oil and verdigris is, and they've, they've tied this head uh, to the ship. And because there's an enormous whale head tied to the ship, uh, the ship is, is tilted over and, and leaning to, to one side. And so Ahab, just as another sort of symbol of his pridefulness and foolishness, uh, trying to capture this bigger whale to even out the ship, he, instead of cutting free that whale, he goes out and he hunts another whale. Uh, and he captures that whale and he ties it to the other side of the ship. And that way, the ship does in fact become level. But now the ship is doubly tied down. It's doubly ponderous in its motions. And this is Melville uh, in his usual subtlety. He's not very subtle, but in his, his usual manner is, is trying to suggest an interesting symbol here. That rather than Ahab, rather than evil man, cutting himself free from one error and allowing himself to move freely upon the ocean, simply ties a, a counterbalancing error to the ship in an effort to try to bring it level. So again, this is the, the image. He has a giant whale head on one side of the ship, and the ship is leaning too far one way. And finding the ship not able to move very well through the ocean, hey, Silas. he <laughs> kills another whale and ties its heavy head to the other side to balance the ship out. And uh, Melville says, uh, what the sh ship had tied to it was Kant, this rationalist, on one side. And finding itself unable to move with its cerebral, logical focus, with its, its purely inward-looking mental reasoning, he ties onto him another whalehead. And he calls this whalehead Locke, who represents attention to experience. And so Melville says, this is the, the picture of evil man in the, in the world, in the modern world. He finds himself overburdened with rationalism on the one side. He finds his, his motions overburdened with rationalism on the one side. And so rather than cutting that free, rather than being true to his nature, a buoyant ship upon the ocean, he instead ties to the other side an attention to nature and experience and tries to solve his problems by evening out his rationalism. His, his over-attention to what is inside his mind, to what logic can know by itself, he tries to cure that with empiricism, with attention to nature and experience. And he says, you fool Ahab. What you ought to have done is cut free both heads and traveled freely upon the ocean. And that's a, a, a proper introduction to our, our topic over the last two weeks. Last week, uh, we considered the rationalist tradition in law and its problems. Uh, namely, the, the rationalist tradition says we can reduce law to an, an outward working of what we can know by reason, by, by pure reason, by pure efforts to make the law more and more coherent according to uh, internal implicit ideas 
that we have, we can work out an entire uh, legal system. And you, you see the last outworkings of this in, in guys like Kant and, and Hegel, uh, but it's a tradition that goes way back uh, into the, the origins of, of Roman law. There are elements of it today very much alive in the civil law tradition that we can work out a scheme of law by which we can solely through the workings of reason determine how the law should apply to particular cases. And last week we said uh, the law of, of Moses presented to us as a, a perfect law stands as a testimony against the Ahab-like arrogance of one who would try to reduce the human pursuit of justice, the human pursuit of law to a pure reason. It, it is a, a mistake because even as we saw the perfect law of God we are told by Moses, leaves you with difficult cases. Even the, the perfect revelation of the divine law that we have, Moses says, there will be cases that are too hard for you to decide. And the only way to resolve them is to go directly to God himself, to take a measure from God himself. We, we, we saw that uh, Christ, when he, he comes and gives us a perfect fulfillment of this perfect law, does not simply announce a, a rational, a new rational principle for us to follow, but rather points to a historical reality, his own witness of life and death on our behalf. He, he gives us only one new command, uh, to love each other as he has loved us in life, and in, in death. And so I, I suggested to you last week that if you think that human law can be better than the perfect law given uh, by Moses to man, well then, you might have hope for the rationalist project. You might have hope that we could do better for ourselves than God could do for his people. When God gave a perfect law to his people, a law he said was perfect, nevertheless he said, there will be hard cases, and in those hard cases, you cannot simply have a rational recourse to the written law, but you must come to me, the, the source of love, the, the measure through love of all things, the source of grace, the source of life, you must return to me. And of course, the people found this very difficult. When they had Moses, Moses did it for them. They had a mediator, Moses, and Moses would go into the tabernacle, and there would be the ark. And we read in, in Deuteronomy that God would appear to Moses between the, the angels on top of the, of the ark, above the mercy seat. And in that, in that dark, he would meet with God face to face, and then he would come out and he would give answers on God's behalf to the people. We, of course, in the place of Moses, have Jesus Christ. We have his love. We have a, a direct revelation of his love that we can understand through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the analogy would be, uh, to you rationalists, Christ says, no, it isn't the power of your mind that you need. For easy cases, super. For easy cases, that's wonderful. But there will be hard cases where you need to, to come before God. You need to come as the people came through Moses. You need to come through me. You need to come to an understanding of God's love for you by following after Jesus Christ, by accepting him as your true mediator, by learning from him the true law of love. So that was last week. And that's the, the boat was leaning this way. And truly, in the 18th and 19th centuries, after two, three hundred years of a very serious rationalistic project, uh, really and truly, the greatest minds of, of the world had devoted themselves uh, to working out a, a purely rational account of law, to, to reducing law to the outworking of man's reason. But there was a horrible crisis of, of legal science. There was a, a sense of, of failure. There was a sense of failure of the foundations of, of reason. 
There was a sense of failure in the product of reason, that the legal systems that had been produced were not effective. The 19th century brought great social changes, and none of them had been predicted by the rationalistic legal systems that had supposedly been developed in a perfect and comprehensive way. New legal forms, new rights, were found to be necessary for the management of society. And reason, which had supposed to have been sovereign and all-seeing, had failed to foresee them and to uh, provide for them. There was a sense of crisis with respect to reason. And what Melville literally was describing was the, the response to that was not simply to say, ah, like Ahab, we were arrogant. Goodbye. I'm very sad to see him go, but he's so much cuter than me. If he stayed, I know where your attention would have, would have been. It's unfair competition here. <laughs> instead, of, instead of saying uh, our, uh, our approach was wrong, we really did need to say that the, the source of law is Christ. The source of law is the kind of, of divine love that we are called to imitate in Jesus Christ, the world said, no, 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 what we did wrong was we were overbalanced on the side of pure reason. So what we need to do is find a way to balance that out with more historical, empirical attention to nature. And one of the great uh, symbols of this, this change is the the application of the ideas of Darwin from their home in the, the biological realm to man. And you have this, this quote here uh, for early 20th century, Paul Vindegraaff, great uh, uh, Russian uh, immigrant to, the, to uh, the UK, where he became a great legal scholar. Vinogradov uh, talks about the impact of Darwinism on social thought. This is on page 63 of your reading. No event in the history of scientific thought has had greater influence in shaping the habits of mind of researchers and philosophers than the rise of Darwinism. The biological view of evolution focused in that expression has come to dominate not only natural science, our account of where animal species come from, that sort of thing, but also the study of man and society. The decisive feature of the Darwinian synthesis was the application of biological evolution to animal species. That much he accepts. But this happened further, he says. A further step led to application to social groups, human social groups, of Darwin's views of the struggle for existence, of the survival of the fittest, of the process of selection, of adaption by heredity, of the unity of organic life. In other words, people had the experience in the 19th century of an empirical idea that seemed to explain a great mass of confusing diversity in the biological world. Why are there so many species of animals? Who can explain it? Well, Darwin comes along and he proposes this, this empirical mechanism, this material mechanism by which great complexity, uh, by which many, many complicated features of organic life could develop mindlessly, mechanically, blindly, not signifying anything outside survival, not signifying anything outside of momentary existence solely a manifestation of the principles of matter, having no further purpose beyond being what they are, namely surviving. And the only move that was necessary, Vinodograph says, was to apply this same desire to our own human institutions, to our own human social groups, and to look for blind, meaningless mechanisms in matter not in spirit. Previously, the error, and you can see why Darwinianism was so attractive, the error was to find an account in the human mind of all the diversity of law and the felt failure of that, the, the, the pressure that the rationalists put on themselves. They turned away from God 
And they said, it's not from God and Christ's example of love that we'll find the law. We will find it in our own minds. We, we will hunt the great whale, and we will do it with our, the strength of our own minds. And we will determine our lives, and we will provide meaning for our minds in terms of our own inward existence. And at the failure of that, the, the, the natural response was, well, let's just balance that off. We'll add on the other side, not something that comes from our own minds, but we'll say that law arises like the animal species do, like the, the, the fish's uh, tail, like the, the, the eye, like the lion's mane. All of it arises by the blind operation of nature, social forces, that allow certain features to survive, they survive. Other forces uh, kill off certain things, and out of it develops things that look like they have purpose. Just like it looks like animals' uh, features have some purpose. But actually, we're told by Darwin, they have no purpose. They're, they're, they are simply a, a material offshoot. They are a material excrescence of the fight for survival. They evidence no purposeful design. So Vinod Gradov says, the main principles of the movement have proved a most powerful ferment in social sciences. Three ideas emerge as especially powerful in this respect. The idea of gradual adaptation to circumstances. The idea of a continuous connection between the lowest and highest forms of animal life and human life, just as animals develop from single-celled amoeba up into uh, more complicated animals, so societies develop in the exact same way. The idea of a transformation of individual faculties through the life of social groups. The idea that just as cells are a part of, of the, the macro evolution of animals, so too individuals are shaped in their nature and purposes by the, the great evolution of social groups. And so here you have his uh, conclusion to the whole matter. A saying of Yearings, Rudolf von Yearing is who he's referring to, may be taken as an appropriate epigraph to the evolutionist movement in social sciences. Law, he was a great uh, scholar of Roman law. Law is not less a product of history than handicraft, than the naval construction, the construction of boats. Then technical skill. Here's the anti-rationalist part. Von Uring is a great anti-rationalist. As nature did not provide Adam's soul with the ready-made idea of a tea kettle, of a ship, of a steamer, even so she has not presented him with property, marriage, binding contracts, or the state. And the same may be said not just of legal rules, but of all moral rules. The whole moral order, including law, is just a product of history. Or to put it more definitely, of the striving toward ends, of the untiring activity and work of the human mind tending to satisfy wants and to provide against difficulties. Everything that you believe about right or wrong, if you apply the Darwinian scheme to it, it's just a, an evolutionary tactic. Uh, when you say murder is wrong, that's because societies that uh, prohibit murder tend to thrive, and societies that allow murder tend to fail. The reason why all societies tend to prohibit murder is because they're the only ones that survive. If a society doesn't prohibit stealing, it dies. And that's why we find that all societies prohibit murder and stealing because they're the only ones that make it. All the ones that didn't prohibit murder and, and stealing, they went the way of the dodo bird. Evolution worked its grinding pressure upon them until they disappeared. The same with all morality. All morality, all laws, they manifest nothing than th the same kinds of pressures that we see when we see a peacock's tail, or a monkey's tail, or a fish's tail, when we see the, the, the toes of an animal, the legs of an animal, there's nothing designed. There's no spirit behind them. It's just that the things that didn't develop features that made them fast in the water or fast on the land, they died. 
societies that didn't develop rules against murder and stealing, they died. When we look around, therefore, what do we see? We see Darwinian champions, and we don't see any Darwinian failures. And that's all it means. All of your morals, all of your laws mean nothing more than that for right now, societies with these features tend to survive, and without those features, tend to fail. Okay? So, this was put on the other side of the ship to balance off the rationalism of the day. Von Euring was a great critic of the German rationalists, a great critic of, of those who said we could draw everything from our mind. He said, no, you can draw nothing from your mind. The rules that we have, any rule, the rule against murder, the rule against stealing, any rule, if social conditions change, could cease to be a true and good legal rule because the only meaning of rules is evolution, success, social existence. That's it. Okay. So here you have historically a two great views of, of law. You have a, a view of law that says we draw everything from the human mind. It is, it is solely an outworking of reason. And as, as I've said before, that is not what the scriptures teach us. It, the law is not simply an outworking of the human mind. The law shows it very much, uh, the, 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 the law of Moses very much uh, in, says that we cannot in principle determine all cases with human reason. It says very much that, that uh, the law develops in history. We find in, the, in what's called the perfect law of God, no effort at comprehensive logical development of the law. Rather, it's given a historical presentation. On the one hand, the law of God says, uh, look at my example. Rationalism is wrong. But then the world comes up with this other contender, which is, let's look at the patterns of nature. And today we might add to Darwinianism, uh, we might add economics. It was a great school in the United States, the School of Law and Economics, a great exponents like Richard Posner, a great in the sense of greatly evil, uh, exponents like Richard Posner, but also great in the sense of being very, very brilliant. Um, they say, look, the, the law fundamentally it's a version of Darwinism. The law fundamentally responds to economic forces and is determined by economic forces. And laws tend, by a kind of osmotic pressure, they tend uh, to produce the most economically efficient rules. And if you want to work with the pressure of history, what you will do is modify the law to produce more and more efficient, from an economic sense, rules. And if you try to fight against this, it's like trying to fight against the tide. Economic pressure's always out in the end. All you can do is sort of make a mess of things, and then the economic equilibrium will reassert itself. It's basically very much like what Vinodograph was talking about. Uh, law is not about what law seems to be about. It's not about rights and wrongs. Law is not about uh, any connection to morality. In fact, morality isn't about morality. Everything is really about some form of social existence. Everything is about the material facts of social existence. It, 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 looking in the mind is exactly wrong. You ought to look in the basic forces of nature that determine social existence. The answer of, of the church to this, to this view is the, the same as it is to rationalism, which is there is in you a knowledge of God and the spirit of love that is closer to you and more real to you than your knowledge of nature. You say you want to be empirical. You say you want to attend to your experience. But your most fundamental experience that you have is of your own soul, and it's aching for the love of God. 
The most fundamental experience you have, the one that you deny when you become a materialist, is that there is a difference in you between mere material and spirit and soul. You must deny that experience in the name of experience in order to become a materialist. To say of your own morals, to say of your own laws that they are not really about what is right and wrong, even though you know, you are completely assured, you experience that your revulsion against murder is not so that you can have social existence. Your revulsion against stealing is not so that you can have some sort of social advantage. You have a direct and immediate experience of right and wrong. And admittedly, Paul says, we work to suppress that all the time. It's part of our own experience of our evil that we work to suppress our immediate experience, to deny, because inevitably we find ourselves judging ourselves and calling ourselves evil, which makes us uncomfortable. And so we hasten to the cleanliness of rationalism. We hasten to the meaninglessness of nature, precisely so that we can avoid the judgment that our souls and our consciences heap upon ourselves. Namely, that there is right, and we've turned away from it, and that there is wrong, and we have run into it. The scriptures offer us a different vision of law, free from the errors both of rationalism and of naturalism or, or materialism, one capable of acknowledging both that there is really such a thing as right or wrong. And remember, I mean, this is ultimately what the Darwinian view has to say. There is no right and wrong. This is why Nietzsche and other madmen in the 19th century went crazy contemplating the meaning of modern science. They say, if we take, if we've rejected rationalism and we take modern science seriously, there is no right and wrong. The only reason you don't murder, steal, commit adultery, lie, covet, do whatever you need to do to get ahead individually is because you are weak-minded and you refuse to admit that all of those rules are just put in the place for the advantage of other people. And that whenever you need to violate a rule to get ahead for yourself, there is no reason not to do so because there is only blind, inanimate matter. That's all there is. There is no way that morality, truth, good, virtue, justice could possibly exist. Well, that's a very persuasive argument in one sense. It's also very much like madness. And of course, whether it was through his philosophy or through the syphilis, we don't know why Nietzsche went mad, but his last moments outside of, a, of an institution were hugging and kissing a horse and, and singing love songs to it. You can make your own judgment about why he went mad. But anyone who believes that, it seems to me, should go mad. If all of your consciousness of right and wrong is nothing but a lie and a weakness, if everything which is closest to what I am is nothing but a sign of weakness that I must suppress and deny, what well, seems to me madness is a preferable kind of alternative. The scripture says no. The, the principle at the root of all things is love. Love in the sense that 1 John 4 talks about it. Love in the sense that we read that God is love. Love in the sense that we read and we're told love. Not our love. Love, not, not that we loved, but that God has loved us. Love, not as it's revealed in my lust, not as it's revealed in my, my partisan friendships, love, not as it's revealed in, in uh, any one of my human manifestations, love as it's revealed in Jesus Christ, which can inform all my human relations. Love as it's revealed in Jesus Christ can change the way I father, the way I husband, the way I friend, the way I'm a neighbor, the way I'm a citizen. Love as it's revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And Jesus reveals it to be the same source of the Mosaic Law. 
He says, look back at the Mosaic law. This love that I am showing you, the, the love of God that I am revealing to you, this is the fulfillment of the law. This is what the law has always been about. The, the love that I'm talking about is what all the Mosaic law hangs upon. Paul says it, it sums up all the Mosaic law. He says, love away and you will fulfill the Mosaic law. We approach the Mosaic law in a different way. We, we approach it to do it. And to do that, we do it through loving. Loving the way we want to love? No, no, no. Loving through unity with God. Loving the way that Moses did it, by going and communing with God. And then going out from the presence of God and loving as we've been loved in Jesus Christ. The, the scriptures tell us that the, the law, the Mosaic law, is about love. That the perfect law is about love. It's not a matter of reason. It's not a matter of, of nature. It includes both of those things. It includes nature, because all of nature is made according to the, the logos. All of it's made by Christ and for Christ. It holds together in Christ. All of it is resonant. That the principles of love don't alienate us from God's creation, but put us in harmony with God's creation. It's equivalent to reason. Reason, true reason, is the logos. It, it, true reason understands Christ and is of one mind with God. This is the way to the harmony of reason and nature. Not by choosing the extreme of Darwinianism or choosing the extreme of pure rationalism, but by finding the love of the God who has made the mind and has made the world and unites them together. So if you turn over to page uh, 64, this is just the, the simple, direct teaching that we find throughout the New Testament about the nature of the Mosaic Law. The, the question I, I posed as the organizing one for these readings is, what is the structure of a good law? This is what we're all asking. This is what the Darwinians were proposing. The structure of a good law is nature, red in, in tooth and claw. It is the survival of the fittest. It is whatever works. A good law is a, a law that leads our society to survive, and a bad law is one that through weakness of mind leads us to fail. A good law wins. A bad law fails. The rationalists on, on the other side, they denied that. They said, no, 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 a law is that which flows out of the, the inner workings of our mind. That's what they said the good structure of law was. It's one that's perfectly coherent, perfectly objective. We can run it like a machine. We can turn the crank and get the answer. Now, the scriptures tell us the structure of the good law, the structure of the Mosaic law, is God's love. It is the love that, that draws us to God. It is the love that it sends us out from God to love other people. Teacher, Matthew 22, 36, page 64. What is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus replied, quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, these commands of love are the structure. All the law and the prophets, for that matter, which consist of applications of the law to society at various points in time, all the law hangs it depends upon the principles of loving God and loving your neighbor. Like Moses, we, we go in to the presence of God. We, we go in deeper and deeper into the holy place that God has set aside to abide in. And as we, we find ourselves worshiping God with our whole hearts, our, our whole souls, as we find ourselves presented simply before him, in his, his presence. 
we begin the first movement of law. We, we begin the greatest movement of law. We learn to love God. We are loving God. And the second commandment is like unto it. We, we take that same spirit back out into the world. And we love others with this new self that we have. A self that knows that it's loved by God and transformed by God. That it's received grace in God. That it can afford to love. That it's received so much from God, it can't help but love in the same way to others. Those are the principles by which the entire law of Moses is defined. And traditionally, there are 613 commands in the law of, of Moses about all sorts of things. They, they don't sound like all the commands are about loving. There's commands about property. There's commands about contracts. There's commands about torts. There's commands about criminal law. There's commands about how you worship. There's commands about all sorts of different things. Uh, the Pharisees, we, we read, had gotten so focused on the 613 commands that they had forgotten their relationship to love. They had forgotten that all of these commands had the same inner principle. They, they had forgotten their meaning. We've forgotten the meaning. We read the law today, and instead of saying every time you read a law, ah, what a fascinating law this is. If, if a, an ox gores another man's ox, there should be compensation. What does this have to do with love? How is this a way of loving God? How is this a way of loving your neighbor as yourself? Instead of reading the Mosaic Law as we're taught to by Jesus and Paul, as an instructional guide to love, we ignore it. We ignore the particular commands because we say, ah, oh, this is a bunch of, of, of Bronze Age nonsense in our Darwinian spirit. We say, ah, oh, these commands were aimed to another society in another time. They can't teach us anything because we know that all law is just so social mechanisms that are adapted in a Darwinian sense to local circumstance. So old laws can teach us nothing. We've abandoned the rationalist effort as well. We, we don't try to understand the inner rationality of these, of these norms. We just dispense with the whole thing. But Jesus tells us something exciting. Read Genesis. Read Exodus. Read Numbers. Read Leviticus. Read Deuteronomy. This is a confession of love. This is a, a perfect working out of love, love of God, the beginning, and a return of love to man. Love of God, Moses goes into the dark, into the holy of, of holies. He stands before God, and love is revealed to him, just as Jesus went in, not to a, an imitation of the tabernacle, but to the real tabernacle in heaven. He went into the real mercy seat before God. And he came back out to teach us love. This is the meaning of the law. This is the structure of a good law. This is the basic teaching of the scriptures to us. What is the Mosaic law about? It's about love. That's what the whole thing hangs on. Paul in Galatians jumps up and down. Just love your neighbor as yourself and you'll fulfill the law. Romans 13, let no doubt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. What is, is the law about? Is it a, a rational principle? Is it an empirical principle? It, there is a, a deeper kind of principle. One that isn't limited to mind, one that isn't limited to body or to nature. And that principle is love. Not the way we love, the way Christ has loved. The way, the way Christ has loved us into being. The way Christ has loved us into eternity. The way Christ has loved us and empowered us and given us the ability to love others. So you ask the world, what's the structure of a good law? 
Well, the, the first rebellion against the word of God, the world said, we'll figure it out with our mind. The principle of a good law is that I can figure it all out autonomously. I can figure it out without dependence upon God, without dependence on anything outside of my own mind and my own understanding. And the ship tilts this way. And then with the, the same arrogance, finding a failure on this side. The world says, well, this isn't working. How can we right the ship? Should we cut off our own arrogance? Should we return to the Lord? No, no, no. We will weigh the ship down on the other side with a great pack of focus on Darwinianism and natural science and economics. We will say the law is, is not just about the human mind. It's also about close attention to what works socially, to pragmatism, to economic realities, to the existing social situation. And so, just like Melville's ship, we have this little ship with two great rotting carcasses, two great dead beasts, two foul-smelling, diseased, wormy tributes to our own arrogance, both of which simply slow the ship, which God wanted to proceed freely across the ocean to its destination, down and down and down. The scriptures teach you this plainly, I suggest to you. What is the structure of a good law? Well, we have a good law. The scriptures say we have a perfect law, the Mosaic law. What, pray tell, are we instructed that this law has as a structure. I read the Mosaic Law, I read its 613 commands, if that's the number, that's the traditional number, 365 for each day of the year, and the remaining conform by tradition to the number of organs and bones in the human body. I can't say that that's true. I don't know, other than 365 days a year, I don't know how many bones there are in the body, but that's the traditional, traditional count. I read through those 613 laws and my mind gets confused. I don't understand the principle. I don't understand the order to them all. And they come to our master. They come to Jesus Christ and they say, Lord, what is the structure of this? What is the command that stands out above them all? What is the command that gives order to the rest? On, on what principles does the law hang? And our Savior told us. This law, the good law, the law that all the nations of the world would respect and understand, and, and hew to, this law is based upon loving God. And it has a secondary principle that flows from loving God, and that's to love man. And when Jesus prepared to leave us, he said, understand, I don't leave you without a new command. I leave you with something more. I leave you with a, a revelation of love. This one new command I give you, and it's enough for you. Love each other as God has loved you. He says, as I have loved you. But it's a, a revelation to us of God's love to us. <coughs> so, to summarize, this is the, the story I'm, I'm trying to, to tell you today, the, the narrative account of, of law over many centuries, particularly law in the modern period. As the modern period uh, is born, man looks at law and says, ah, we're, we're awfully clever creatures. We can do better than this. We will create a, a rational construct of law. We, we find that the structure of a good law is that it can be determined from man's understanding and it is perfectly open to man's understanding. This is a rejection of what we're taught in Scripture, which is that you must have periodic reference to the love of God. You must return to God. Sure, there are some cases that are easy. Sure, there are some principles you can work out and you can apply in easy cases. Murder is wrong. Stealing is wrong. You got a guy running around murdering people? He's just naturally got to be stopped. Easy case. But to move from that and say we can determine everything through the power of our mind is an offense to God. We are in continual need. We must continually confess 
our need for the revelation and experience of the love of God. When that project fails, when the exigencies, the pressure of social circumstances seem to show the illusions of the rationalist project, we just make the other error on the other side of the ship. We say, ah, this time we will make a law which is just based on social success, which is just based on economics or Darwinian theory. We will say, like Justice Kennedy did in Obergefell, the law of marriage has no internal meaning. It has no objective principle. Marriage has been changed throughout history. It's simply a product of evolutionary adaptation. If it's changed in the past, it can be changed again. None of it has any meaning. We're just designing the optimal society for our particular social conditions. This is a denial and a betrayal even more foul. If you know anything, if you have any direct experience, any empirical observation, you know that you are not just material. You are not a stone. You have direct experience of your soul. You understand that it exists in dimensions of right and wrong. You have a direct experience of conscience. You know when you do wrong. You know when you do right. You may make errors about that, but you know that right and wrong are real. You know that you are real. There's nothing you know more certainly than that, and yet the Darwinians tell you you are not real. You are just blind atoms bouncing around into whatever congealing forms happen to survive. It's a lie. And the fact that we live according to that lie, that huge portions of the earth today live according to these kind of Darwinian lies, shows us the blind madness that sin can cause us to dwell in. The scriptures tell you something very different. The scriptures reveal to us God's love. The scriptures reveal to us Jesus Christ. They, they show you how in this life, through your repentance, through your returning to Jesus Christ, you can come to understand God's real love for you. The scriptures say to you, look, it is possible to live according to this love. It's, in, it's possible not just to experience God's love, but to give it to other people. In fact, this is the great joy of life. And not only that, this can inform legal systems. In fact, if you want a really good example of it, the scriptures provide you with one. Part of your work as a Christian attorney should be to understand the meaning of loving God and loving your neighbor in legal rules. A really good place to, to start is to read the law of God, which we're told is all about how to manifest the love of God and the love of neighbor in legal rules. The oldest heresy of the, of the church, the second century, was described by Irenaeus as the greatest heresy, is the heresy of a man named Marcion. And Marcion's heresy was simply this. He said, the Old Testament law is of a mean God. It's the, the God of the material world. He created the world for the, the good God's purposes. The, God, the good God is the God of the New Testament. The evil God is the God of the Old Testament. And the Mosaic law is not a law of love. The Mosaic law is a law of cruel mean-heartedness. And you should, you should not understand a unity between the New Testament and the Old Testament. You should understand a strict separation between them. And all the, the passages where uh, Jesus teaches that the, the law of the Old Testament is about love, or Paul teaches this, he just scratched those out of the Bible. He had his own Bible, the Marcionic Bible, and he took all those passages about love, that the, the law was about love, out of the Bible. He did, did not want people trying to understand how the laws of property and tort and contract and criminal law and all the things that we study in our daily operations, how all of those things can be understood not as 
enemies of God, but as a way of showing the love of God. That's why we're here. Because we believe that the law can be, should be, must be, is commanded to be by God. That the structure of a good law is love. Does our law manifest that? Of course not. We're running around half the time we're rationalistic, the other half of the time we're, we're Darwinian. We've fractured and scarred and scraped away most of the traditional structure of Christian law, yet there's still a lot there. There's still a lot of love in it. How do I know that? Because our rules and the Mosaic rules are very similar at many points. We still follow rules of love. We've torn down the marriage part of it. We've destroyed that. Those aren't laws of love anymore. They're laws of hate. But there are still many aspects of the law which are laws of love. There's still room for us to advocate for love. That's our story. Rationalism, wrong. Empiricism, naturalism, wrong. What's right? Love is right. Love as it's revealed in Jesus Christ is right. Love as it has been taught to us by Jesus Christ to animate and be the true principle of a good legal system, that's right. Do we think we have this purely in our brains? No. Do we think we have it purely in experience? No. We have it in Jesus Christ. Listen, if Moses had to go into the tabernacle and stand in the presence of God to rightly judge cases, you need to go to God sometimes too. If to understand what is right and wrong for law, you never go before God, you are doing it wrong. They're not all easy cases. Sometimes you really have to take your questions before God. Why would I do that? Because he teaches me love. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we find ourselves in a, a world that is tossed and turned like a ship on the ocean. One wave drives it one way. Another wave drives it another way. There are so many beliefs and counter-beliefs. So we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to cling to Jesus Christ and to the love that he's revealed, not love the way we do it, but the love that he had for us when we were yet sinners and he died on our behalf. Help us, Lord, to understand his love. Help us, Lord, to live by his love. Help us, Lord, to find ways of restoring the good structure that's possible in, in law, the structure of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.